So welcome to our Empty Moon Zen Sangha Saturday morning meeting, uh, um, the Dharma Talk, uh, which is now being live uh, streamed as well on Facebook. And will eventually find its way to uh, uh, YouTube. Over the past months in a number of meetings with friends within our Zen community, I found one koan keeps intruding into our conversations. It can happen that way with koans. For those of us for whom they are a central part of our uh, spiritual lives, they can pop up in the strangest places. Winking, inviting, even on occasion grabbing us and pulling us into the depths. Once one realizes that Zen is not about controlling our blood pressure or capturing a moment of calm in the storm, we begin to find we are on a pilgrimage, a sacred journey to heal the great hurt, to find the meaning of our lives. This koan goes, you find yourself in a stone crypt, a tomb. The door is locked from the outside and there are no windows. And then the point. The poke in the eye, the cold slap from the universe, a call to our hearts. How are you free? Over these weeks, there's been a gathering, there's been gathering emotion around this case. At first, it was just sort of a sort of casual, just a, a recollection. Do you remember the stone crypt go on? But as time has passed, the references have become more visceral. I feel like I'm in that stone crypt. It's cold. It's dark. I'm beginning to feel afraid. Mostly we get the idea behind the image. No matter who we are, our lives are constrained. Whatever our desire for autonomy might be, we always, always will find walls. But then there is constrained and there is constrained. For most people in the affluent West, if you're not an hourly worker, you might not even see the walls most of the time. But now, here, in the midst of the coronavirus, many of us who maybe have been able to avoid the harsher face of the question of what that stone tomb genuinely points to, are now finding it up front and, well, it can be pretty ugly. The crypt, the tomb, is our bodies. It is our minds. It is the stories we tell about ourselves. And a lot of people who have heard of koans think they're non sequiturs. Words empty of meaning. People who don't practice with them as a spiritual discipline easily confuse them with other word games. As a Facebook friend recently did with me citing the question about a tree falling in the woods and whether there's a sound, assuming that was a koan. Word game, maybe, but the stakes are much higher. They speak to who we really are, and they offer us an invitation to find what that real might be. It is in that context I find myself thinking of Herschel Schachter. I was um, digging around in my files, and I was uh, uh, noticing that when I've commented on this koan in the past, I've come back to this anecdote uh, um, as an illustration for how important this koan can really be. Today, with the coronavirus keeping so many of us confined, and how hard that is, and in, is increasingly more difficult, where people are poking against the walls, sometimes slammed against the walls, sometimes even claiming it's got to be a plot to control us, something sometimes moving into very foolish territory. With all that happening, Rabbi Schachter and his story takes us right to the point. That poke, that slap, maybe even a warm embrace. 
He was a leader of the uh, modernist Orthodox movement who died in 2013. But outside of that spiritual community, he is mostly recalled for an incident at the close of the Second World War. It was the 11th of April, 1945. Hard to get more specific. He was a Jewish chaplain attached to the 8th Corps of the 3rd Army. Herschel Schachter was, one, was the first Jewish chaplain to enter Buchenwald. No more than an hour after its liberation. In her obituary for the rabbi in the New York Times, Margaret Fox describes how the smoke was still rising. He later would describe the memories seared into his heart. That smoke in his eyes, the smell of burning flesh, and the hundreds of bodies strewn about. Personally, I read these words and I can feel the sting in my eyes, and I understand in a safely distant way the stench of the camps. It was something horrendous. Walking into Buchenwald was walking into the wreck of a slaughterhouse. It seemed everyone had been murdered, and he had to ask, were any Jews still alive? He was taken to the barracks, where people too weak to move lay in bunks, confused, terrified. Not knowing what was happening, it fell to him to tell them. Shalom Aleichem. Yidden, he called out in Yiddish. Ihr sind frei. Peace be upon you, Jews. You are free. He ran to every one of the barracks, repeating his call of rescue, of freedom. The rabbi spent months there helping. Among the survivors, there were a thousand orphans alone, all needing tending. Among them, he helped a teenage Eli Weissel. I am hesitant to tell such a story here. I don't want to cheapen the reality of Buchenwald. And we are talking a horror. But what we're invited into is something that is of a piece with this terrible story. We are being invited into a moment where stars die. And it is hard to look. It is easy to turn away. I've read that today about a third of Americans don't actually believe there was a Holocaust. More minimize it, while two-thirds of millennials don't even recognize the word Auschwitz. So, so, there we are as human beings. Horrors too horrible to hold. So, we forget. We deny. It's a trick we like to play with ourselves. Some things are sufficiently terrible that we don't want to believe them. We certainly don't want to face them square. Denial. As the song goes, I travel the world and the seven seas. Everybody's looking for something. Some of them want to use you. Some of them want to get used by you. Some of them want to abuse you. Some of them want to be abused. Of course, in the song, the answer is hold your head up and keep moving on. Sort of the existentialist response to the absurdity of the world. A more lyrical version of the World War II English poster, Keep Calm and Carry On. We do this. It can be important to move on, to carry on. But deeper truths await those who pause and look. The story that we, each of us, calls me is a construct. It is based in real things like genes and experiences, but how it is woven together is, well, to shift the image, a stone crypt. We each have one. We each are one. And that's what the koan calls us to. After all our coping devices have failed us, they will, ultimately they will, we are all of us mortal. 
We are all of us constrained. We can deny and limp along, or we can move in another direction. So then, now, here we are. In all our various ways, with our internal worlds and the external world, each bumping into the other. After all, they're not unconnected. Here, where we're living and breathing right now, a lot of people are on the streets, each damaged in their own way, mental illness and addiction, sure. Missing two paychecks, sometimes. Others are not quite there, but are in danger of losing their homes. Some are hungry, hungry. While some are growing fat within the confinement. Each a blending of harsh realities and dreams of meaning. Real rubber meeting real roads. With that, there is that dreaming world, the interior world, inside and out, are not one, but neither are they two. Here we find mysterious reality. Us, you, me, a crypt, a tomb. In that moment, in this moment, how are you free? This is the promise. Once our hearts have opened just a little, just where we get a taste of the reality of that inner and outer world are in fact connected or when we notice perhaps more correctly, they're not one, but neither are they two. The connections are subtle, except when they hit you like a brick or a virus. And here you are, here I am, in the stone crypt, a tomb. Refugees fleeing horrors in Central America, sitting in a camp in Gaza, looking for clean water in Flint still. The list is very long, and not all of it dramatic. Isolation, despair, addiction, small things, personal tragedies, and, and, of course, love, and work that satisfies, and friends, joys. They are all the tomb. Can you see the connections? After the stories we tell about them are exhausted, can you notice? After we've set down judgment and justification, what is then plain as the nose on your face? I think of Brother Lawrence. He was a peasant in 17th century France. He had been a soldier and fought in the Thirty Years' War. He had been wounded and was lame for the rest of his life. He also had some sort of experience in those horrific times some mysterious encounter that would not leave his heart and informed how he acted. After a period of convalescence, he worked as a footman for a nobleman, you know, wearing livery and opening doors and attending at meals. But this deep encounter that would not leave his heart called him on. Eventually, he was admitted as a lay brother in a Carmelite monastery. Lay brother. As a peasant, he was not admitted into the full vows uh, as a monk and did not join the monastic choir in the rhythms of monastic prayer. Instead, he worked in the kitchen. He did this for the rest of his life, except toward the end where his wounded leg ulcerated and he was put to work mending sandals so he could sit. We only know about him because people, at first simply other lay brothers, and from them peasants who had heard about him began talking. He had some sense of grace, something truly and deeply alive, just in who he was, that captured people's imaginations. He was them, totally one of them, and there was something else. People would meet him and want to spill their wound, the wounds of their souls out to him. In response, he would give them his attention, and it felt his love for them just as they were. He wasn't a priest. He couldn't forgive sins. Apparently, he could do something more than that. Gradually, the monks became aware of him, and eventually, important people would find their way to the kitchen to talk. 
One of those was uh, those important people was a priest named Joseph de Beaufort. He collected notes from his visits and, after Brother Lawrence died, published a small volume about his encounters with this remarkable peasant lay brother. All of that a bit of a long way around to offer some words about the key. Not the key to attitude adjustment, to lowering blood pressure, but to something rather more. To something that justifies referencing Buchenwald. I have, wrote the lay brother, abandoned all particular forms of devotion, all prayer techniques. My only prayer practice is attention. I carry on a habitual, silent, and secret conversation with God. Please note, he says conversation. He could have said dance. If he were of another character, he could have cited Jacob's long night wrestling with that angel. Or, as another character, he could sing of lovemaking. But for him, conversation. And the brother concludes, out of this something, out of this, something fills me with overwhelming joy. All of it. All of it. Accepting no part. Here in this place, in this body, as this body, as this place. Peace be upon you. You are free. Today, here, now, how are we free? In this moment, with all the strife and hurt of this world, our shortcomings as human beings, our collaboration with the killers, our fears, our heroic acts, our small acts, we're involved into all of it. In this moment, in this moment, how are we free? Peace be upon you. You are free.